Welcome to SciShow Tangents, the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm the host of this tremendously popular, internationally successful show, Hank Green. And joining this week, as always, is science expert, Sari Riley. Hello, I'm world-renowned. World-renowned? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say so. And our resident everyman, Sam Schultz. Hi, I'm a local boy done good. <laughs> <laughs> That's more correct for you, yeah. Yeah. Um, what a pleasure it is to be back with all of you today, back here in the the podcast studio, because my office is still being renovated, oh. and I love it. It's nice to come it in and see nice. the people. You look, it's you look like you're time. really relaxed. But Sam Schultz knew exactly what he was doing when he, an hour or two ago, yeah. tweeted a picture of Smokey the Bear and Winnie the Pooh. Mm-hmm. Two bears who wear either a shirt and no pants or pants and no shirt. Yes. And asking which of these two bears is the filthiest. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the lewd yeah. bear? A bear with no pants or a bear with no shirt? Because the weird thing is you'd think it'd be the bear with no pants. It should be by all logic because the man with no pants would certainly be more certainly lewd. Certainly be the more mm-hmm. lewd, Yes. Yeah. And yet you look at Smokey and you're like, sir, stop looking at me like that. He's yeah. always looking at me like that for people with the video podcast. You got, yeah, he's got there. a big Smokey in his in his uh, <laughs> a oof, big old Smokey. studio. I don't know yeah. how you work under those conditions. Yeah. Because I think Smokey is as lewd as you can get. Mm-hmm. The mystery yeah. of what is under those pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we know exactly what's under Winnie the Pooh's pants. Smooth. Nothing. Nothing. Yep. No. Winnie the Pooh <laughs> is stuff and fluff and a honey yeah. belly. Can't uh-huh. get more pure than that. Donald Duck is just yeah. some angry little feet down uh-huh. there. <laughs> Flailing all around. Uh, and his big funny he, butt. He's got a really big funny butt. Yeah. He's got a funny butt. <laughs> there's never There's never been poop. No poop has ever come out of that funny butt. Don't cover that funny butt up. It's too hilarious. Yeah. No, yeah. it's a Zero great times. physical comedy. But Smokey yeah. the Bear, the yeah. way that he's holding that shovel, uh-huh. also <laughs> partially obscuring his... You Hello. don't know what he's got in those pants. Like, why is he... He's showing off the shirt, and the things he's hiding in the pants make him yeah. feel very <laughs> dangerous to me. Yeah, it's like, oh, wow. it's like by putting dangerous. on pants, you're just saying, I'm a man. <laughs> I'm a bear man. I stand on two feet. I'm a bear man and I need to wear pants. Yep. I look at this picture and I, I think to myself, well, it's obvious this is how I feel. Mm-hmm. That Pooh is being more lewd because Pooh is not wearing pants. Okay. But Smokey is by far sexier. <laughs> and that is the more upsetting <laughs> That thing. is the lewdest so you of think, all. <laughs> so you think Pooh is making the conscious choice not to be wearing the pants and is like, heh heh, look at me? Or what? It's a little bit <laughs> weird to walk around with a sh- Like if he was wearing nothing, yeah. then I might be on That's board not with weird. you. But he put on a shirt to maybe cover up his- Maybe he's cold. Just a little fashion. <laughs> like that's <laughs> it. it. Like you never put on, if you were to put on either a shirt or a pants mm-hmm. when it's cold, I think I would put on a shirt. Or like a yeah, sweatshirt. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, but I tweeted that to you, that my feeling about about the, the lewd yeah. versus the sexy, and someone responded, I thought it, but I wasn't brave enough to say <laughs> it. <laughs> it's true. I hadn't really thought about it, which I feel like says something about me, but you're right, and it made my poll feel like a sham poll, as so often they do. <laughs> what? Because How did the poll go, though? Who was the more lewd? It's still going, because I gave it 24 hours. Um, so 133 votes after a couple hours, it's almost 50, 50, which is shocking. Oh, wow. It's 51% pants with no shirt is looter, but it's a couple votes away from it being, which surprises me. Well, I think if the, if it's pants with no shirt or shirt with no pants, I think that that makes sense that it would be 50, 50 in this situation. Mm. But with the particular photos, if you go look at the pictures, (laughs) yeah, Smokey definitely has had thoughts before. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that who never has. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, who who is that clip from the the Barbie movie trailer where they're like, oh, let's go, let's sleep over for what? I don't know. That's Pooh's brain. That's Pooh. Head yeah. empty. <laughs> and sleep over. But before Smokey gets in bed, he unzips that big long zipper on his pants. <laughs> yeah. All right. Them Every week here on Dance, <laughs> we get together to try to one up, amaze, and delay each other with science facts. While also trying to stay on topic, our panelists are playing for glory and also for Hank Bucks, which I will be awarding as we play. And at the end of the episode, one of them will be crowned the winner. Now, as always, we introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem. This week, 
It's from Sam. Green, purple, yellow, gray, and electric blue, just to name a few of those beautiful hues. They warn us, entice us, they tell us a lot. Like, that frog is poisonous, that pepper is hot. Or they're Mm. just simply pleasing, like when you go to a fancy museum to look at works by Van Gogh. So stop to smell the roses, but also spare a thought for that fantastic spectrum which makes those roses pop. And as you admire that setting red sun, those green blossoms of spring, a pink bubble of gum, or the blazing orange leaves of late September, I'd ask you one thing. Won't you please remember, you see all of this because of beams from outer space bouncing off of stuff and going into your face. (laughs) (laughs) The topic for the day is color, which seems like such a beautiful subjective experience or objective experience, Mm -hmm. but it's not. And... I think that I know what color is. Sari, what's color? I think we have a pretty good boundary okay. on color. At least for human experience. Yeah. Yeah. It gets messy when you're like, other animals experience colors. And you're like, well, is that, I mean, nah. Is that the same thing? Yeah, there's yeah. like two pieces to the color experience. One, there is the wavelengths of light, of, en- of electromagnetic radiation that mm-hmm. we deemed to be the visible spectrum that is visible to us that is visible to us as humans and the specific wavelengths or frequencies that we have defined to be different bands of color from red orange yellow green Mm -hmm. blue indigo so there's like a real physical like the wavelength of a photon Mm -hmm. of like Mm -hmm. a wave of light and then there is the thing that i see the color Those are two different things, but they are closely related. Yeah, and then color vision. The thing that you see that is the color is where it gets kind of mushy because Mm -hmm. that is post those wavelengths of light mashing into your face, specifically into the back of your eye uh, and specialized retinal cells called cone cells that have photoreceptors in them that take that light energy, those wave wavelengths of of electromagnetic radiation and translate them in your brain and then you perceive colors Mm -hmm. you perceive Mm -hmm. uh sometimes a single color but usually a a mush or a blend of them Mm -hmm. um and your brain does some interpretation in that process of things that are brighter things that are darker this is how optical illusions happen because our brain does so much processing on the wavelengths of light that reach our eyes that it makes assumptions. And sometimes you see a picture of a dress and you think it's blue and black. And sometimes you think it's white and gold. Um, Oh no. (laughs) (laughs) And then you argue with your friends about it. Yeah. Because the the red you see is not the, the red I see. Yeah. Yeah. Once it gets to perception, it gets tricky. And, and of course there's always the, the, the sort of, universal question of is my orange your orange Mm -hmm. um and like you can't know i guess it seems like probably it is but you can't know for sure until i can beam my consciousness into your perception which is a ways away so people are working on it (laughs) (laughs) when you talk about like other animals and the colors they see can we only glean that from like looking at their rods and cones and stuff or is there a way to like plug a usb port into a dog's eyeball and be like "Eh, there we go i don't know how they do it but i know that you could do it either of those way uh, ways like you could you could have the like vision center hooked up to something um and be able to tell when it's being activated Mm. you could show them a, a, a wavelength of light that we can't see And uh, you would be able to see that it was seeing something. Okay. But I think that that's not how it's done and that it is done by looking at the molecules themselves and seeing that when a a photon with a wavelength of a certain wavelength hits it, it activates. That is my understanding. A lot of it is math and estimates of Mm. like figuring out if it contains cones and rods, what those are, what colors those molecules can detect and like mm-hmm. get activated by and then counting the number, counting the location to see what kind of vision they have in front of them in their periphery and whatnot. And like, again, comparing it to what we know about human vision. So we know, for example, that 
our cones are concentrated in the center of our eye in an area called the fovea. And our peripheral vision, we don't see color very well, but our brains kind of fill it in for us so we can see, okay, that's like our experience of vision. Now, where are cones concentrated in an animal's eyes and what do they see? Mm. What what can we guess that they see based Mm -hmm. on that? All right. So I think I know what color is now. This sounds like a word that has a cool origin, though. So color, uh, the root word for color, as far as I can tell, comes from the same Indo-European base as hull, um, like the hull of a ship, and means a sort of covering. And so the color... The, the idea of mm. color first applied to someone's complexion or their skin color or the appearance oh. of something, as opposed to, like, the colors around us in the environment. So, like, like a covering or a paint or a... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, or, or a skin or... Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then I think... I, I don't know... I tried to do some research about what we called, like, pigments and dyes because right. humans have been making art and things like that for longer, like so, so long Mm -hmm. that it seems like we should have had a word for that. I couldn't find the word for that, but I assume it was something related to like, it wasn't color. It certainly wasn't color. And color is now Mm -hmm. the word that encompasses them all. After we used it to refer to complexion, then we're like, "Eh, we kind of need an umbrella term for all this other stuff, all these pigments, all these like the, the, the hue or the tint or the Mm -hmm. visible aspects but there's so many times you have to be like, what color is that thing? What were they saying before? It, How do I know which berry to eat? About what color is the berry I'm supposed to eat? <laughs> what are they doing? I don't know what they'd say. They probably they'd just... say ripe, like they'd know. Oh, yeah. boy. This berry okay. good. That's it. <laughs> this one. This yes. one here, Sam. This one. Uh, All right, everybody. That means it's time to move on to the quiz portion of our show where we're going to play a little game called Colors, Where's the Lie? Oh, Colors, okay. as we've been saying, are very good, uh, but they can also be deceptive. For example, the dress debate of 2015. So today, in honor of all of the colors that have tricked us before, we're going to play Where's the Lie? I'm going to tell you some kind of science story, and everything that in that story is going to be true, except for one thing, and it's up to you to figure out where the lie is. The dress was in 2015. We're old, Sam. Jesus. We're all going to die. That was almost 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. All right. Story number one, picky plates. Researchers have studied how smell and food texture can affect picky eaters. But in 2022, a team of researchers from the University of Portsmouth wanted to see whether color could play a role. So they recruited 50 people and divided them into two groups based on how picky they were about food. And then they served them a snack in different colored bowls and found that the picky eaters tended to find food sweeter in red and blue bowls compared to food served in white bowls. So it's not that they thought it was sweeter in the red bowl. They thought it was like more savory or something because it's like red blood. Mm -hmm. Mm. Maybe it's it has to do with if the food contrasted with the plate mm. more than it tasted worse because they were like, man, I'm eating a green broccoli out of a red bowl. This is a, a sensorily <laughs> bad, bad experience. Difficult. Yeah, here. that doesn't sound yeah. good. Sam, you got that very close to correct. They found the snack saltier in the red and blue ah. bowls, not sweeter versus okay. in the white bowls. Hmm. So I don't I don't know. Also, like that probably depends on what the the, the snack is. Uh, like if it was ice cream, they probably didn't find it salty at all. Yeah. But it was a snacky snack. Yeah. Now we've got story number two, color changing minerals. The mineral hackmanite is a is white until you put it under a UV light, at which point it changes color and turns purple. The process is reversible, so when you take it out of the UV light, it will change back to white. Researchers from the University of Turku in Finland found that the color changes thanks to movement of silicon atoms. And when comparing it to other color-changing minerals, they found that the speed of the color changes correlated to how far those atoms move from their original spot in the mineral. Uh, this game's for smart people. I can't even ah. remember everything you just said. <laughs> so it's irreversible. How about that? You can't reverse yeah. the process. Oh, uh, good, mm-hmm. good, good. That's a great one. I'm going to say it changes from white to like green instead because ultraviolet purple seems too too convenient 
Mm. Mm. God, you're both very far away. Oh, oh, keep no. fighting it out. <laughs> keep fighting. Because oh. it, is, it is true that if you put it in sunlight, it turns this beautiful purple color. It's also true that it is reversible. So uh, they can, they, and it can make that change over and over again without it being, uh, without that color structure being destroyed. What do you think? Uh, I don't think it has to do with the speed of the color change. I think it has to do with like the rotation of the silicon atoms so that there's like yeah, a structural color element yeah. involved. Um, because if light is bouncing around in one way and then bouncing around in another way, in the way that like if you shift a prism, the light splays out quite radically different. It's not silica because that's not colored like nothing. So that can be it. How about that? That's it, Sam. Yes. Oh. <laughs> um, it's actually sodium atoms, not silicon well, atoms. Not really it colored is like movement either, is of it? atoms around mm. in the in the in the mineral. The color, the amount of color change is actually correlated to how far the sodium atoms move around. Now, the part where you said because that's not purple, that's I have no idea what c- determines the actual color because sodium atoms also don't seem very purple to me. No. But I guess when you're shining all like different lights on stuff, you're getting all kinds of crazy reactions, right? Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's like, so the way that color happens, Hank can correct me because I'm rusty. I'm always rusty on chemistry, but it's like the way that electrons are arranged. And if you can excite them, so the ultraviolet light like inputs energy into the system, makes the electrons jump up an energy level. And then when they relax back down, relax in quotes, back down to a lower energy level, they spit out the color. Um, And so it doesn't particularly matter what the the atoms are like it does to some extent but more like what where the electrons are in that bonded compound and like to what levels they can jump and fall to that that like produces those oh, wavelengths yeah. of color the that enter and into our eyeballs. Thing. the jumping and falling uh-huh. thing is why i failed chemistry and all those other classes i don't really <laughs> get that stuff i loved doing it you draw the little half arrows mm-hmm. no thanks color is very weird All right. Your final story, you guys, is about zebra finch beaks. So young zebra finches have pink beaks, and as they age, their beaks change color. Uh, Male zebra finch beaks turn bright red, a color that plays a role not only in mating, but in asserting their place in the male zebra finch hierarchy. To see how these beaks are affected by environmental noise, researchers raised finches for 90 days under one of the following conditions. Under constant exposure to urban noise, under pink noise, or to the sounds of a normal aviary. And they found that male zebra finches raised with urban noise had less bright beaks compared to their counterparts raised in the other conditions. Interesting. I think that if they were raised with urban noise, they had brighter beaks because cities throw everything out of whack. They got to be more assertive. That's exactly what I was going to say, pretty much. Oh, nice. So wait, now I got to read it again and think of a different one. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm I'm 0 for 2 so far. So whatever you land on will probably be it, Sam. Uh, 90, maybe 90 days isn't isn't long enough. Maybe it was two years. Well, having a 90 day time point uh, is a good is was the, their their time scale. And that is what they used. Um, and uh, also that they did have less bright beaks. So, so far, both of you have uh-huh. not found uh-huh. the lie. OK. <laughs> it wasn't the sound of a normal aviary. It was a weird aviary. <laughs> <laughs> it was a rowdy aviary. Yeah. Full yeah. Of yeah there was birds full of with pants. Yeah. Pants, but no. <laughs> Shirts, <laughs> the opposite of Donald Ducks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the, where you have to think, what's under those pants? <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. Uh, young zebra finches do not have pink beaks. There it is. Young zebra finches have black beaks. Everybody knows oh, that. What? Obviously, you know they t- <laughs> that black to red pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> they have black beaks at about one month in their beaks start to change color and, and they'll reach their adult color when they're around 65 days old. So Sarah, you got a point there. Was there any like, is that why they, is, is there any idea why their beak color was different based on the sounds being pumped at them? Just that they were less, uh, they were stressed maybe. Hmm. 
Is it less bright in that it maintained more of the black? So like it was that dullness. Mm. Oh, I see. They just want to be baby. When I'm stressed, I just want to be baby too. (laughs) (laughs) Like, uh, no, thank you. Adult Siri. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Just pretend my beak is black right now. Thank you. (laughs) Uh Please feed me a worm. (laughs) (laughs) Next up, we're going to take a short break. Then it'll be time for the fact off. Welcome back, everybody. Get ready for the fact off. Our panelists have all brought, have all, both of you have brought science mm-hmm. facts to present in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they have presented their facts, I will judge and award Hank Bucks any way I see fit. Sam's coming in with a slight lead. Uh, and to decide who goes first, I have a trivia question for y'all. In 2017, the longest lasting rainbow ever was recorded in Taiwan near the Chinese Culture University in Taipei. The area could get long rainbows thanks to the combination of monsoon systems and slow winds that keep moisture trapped in the air. This particular rainbow lasted so long that professors at the Department of Atmospheric Science told their staff and students to take photos every second to try and capture the entirety of its stay, resulting in at least 100,000 images in the department. How long did this rainbow last? I feel like there's a clue in there. But the 10,000? Yeah, sure, 10,000, Sari. That's what he said. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that doesn't seem like it could possibly be true because that would be 27 hours. But sun goes down, right? <laughs> sun goes down. Yeah, sun's got to sun's be up. Got to be less than 24 hours. Okay, I'm going to guess. it's uh, Arctic. I'm going to guess a good solid 12 hours. I'm going to go low. Four hours? You guys made me too mad. Oh, no. <laughs> You're we got me the math mad. wrong last, last episode. Yeah, somebody said that you did. <laughs> everybody's mad at us because <laughs> you picked the wrong person last time. Yeah. Uh, it was, say, did you say 12 hours? Yeah. It's Sam. Okay. It's, it was eight mm-hmm. hours and 58 minute long rainbow. Wild that they told their staff and students to take photos every second instead of just like setting a cam. Maybe they don't yeah. have a camera ready to just. They had nine hours <laughs> to get a camera ready. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go now. When you're a very teeny tiny delicious little creature, like say maybe the larva of a crustacean floating around in the ocean, it would be handy to be pretty much completely transparent. And wouldn't you know it? Mm-hmm. A lot of them are. But a baby crustacean's got to eat, and something that doesn't work so well when it's transparent is eyes. For an eye to work, light has to hit some sort of light-sensitive receptor, and if that receptor lets light pass through it, it's not really doing a lot of recepting. So for the most part, an animal's light-sensing organ is basically like a dark spot of some sort. So if you've got to eat, but if you're counting on being basically transparent in order to not get eaten, a dark spot is essential, but also sort of going to fuck up your whole strategy. But those baby crustaceans I mentioned earlier seem to have landed on a really clever workaround. So in the past, crustacean researchers have noted that many types of crustaceans have very vividly colored eyes in their larval stage, but they lose that eye color when they grow up. And a paper published in February 2023 looked into what exactly was going on with these larval eyes and figured out that what they were looking at wasn't exactly their eyes, but actually a dome of reflective organic glass that was sitting on top of the eye. Looking at this dome with an electron microscope, revealed that the domes were made of crystalline nanospheres described as being disco ball like and that they're coated in reflective molecules across different crustacean species these little disco balls are different sizes and the different sizes causes them to reflect different colors so the smaller they are the more blue they reflect and the bigger they are the more yellow they reflect and there seems to be a correlation between how like clear blue clean or grimy and yellow the water that the creatures live in Uh, Mm. and the color reflected from their eye domes. Some even seem to have domes that can rearrange themselves a bit to reflect differently depending on how much light is hitting them. So I guess what I haven't actually come out and said yet is that using these reflective domes, the larva can reflect back the color of their surroundings, obscuring their eye spots Mm. and making them almost invisible. But how, you might be wondering, can the larva still see with a reflective dome over their eyes? Well, the dome (laughs) has little holes in it so they can just see through it, so... They figured that part out, too. (laughs) I thought it was going to be a one-way mirror. No, just holes. That would be really cool, but 
Nature ain't cracked the one-way mirror yet, I don't think. So when they grow up, the dome goes away, but the adult crustaceans have that mirror in the back of their eyes that like dogs and cats have that make them glow in the dark. Mm -hmm. And that mirror Mm -hmm. is made out of the same stuff as the eye dome. It's not like the, the same exact dome. It's just the same structure, but in the back of the eye instead. And that's how they do it. And that's the end of my story. It's not easy to be out there I like my great hope for all these tiny animals that get, get eaten all the time is that like evolution didn't provide them with a strong sense of like uh, just fear of mortality. Yeah, or, I think about that a lot uh, too. A lot of pain receptors that they're not swimming around the ocean like ah the whole time. <laughs> they couldn't possibly be. I hope. Like is is that what a life of a mouse is like? Just constant screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe mice. I could see. I'm mice in danger. <laughs> yeah. And what do these things turn into? I mean, crustaceans could be anything. It's just a bunch of different kinds. It's not every kind, but it's uh, gotcha. across the whole kingdom or whatever crustaceans are. Are they a kingdom? Gotcha. It's probably a phylum. Kingdom is subphylum. Animal. Yeah, it's a subphylum. Oh. Ugh. Under I arthropods. Have... Yeah, we just had to sneak oh, in an gosh. extra layer. There's right, a, there are arthropods. I hang up my hat. I can no longer be a science man. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the the idea that some, but because the the diverse group of arthropods, including things like krill, shrimp, makes sense. Also barnacles, and so now I like yeah. the idea of baby barnacles. I don't think they got an eye anywhere. Maybe no. an eye spot if yeah, they're lucky. I bet but they do a little reflective dome just as they're sticking out their tongues. Oh man. They've, we've found so many different ways to do life. I hope the barnacles last forever. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, but I'd prefer to I'd prefer this lifestyle. Yeah, barnacles yeah. can't podcast. No, but they also can't mess up phylum and subphylum and just be thinking about that all night tonight. They also can't perceive Smokey the Bear. So, <laughs> that's a leg up. <laughs> Compared to us, if they saw yeah. Smokey the Bear, then it'd be like, that's not food. Yeah. They wouldn't be like, what's in his pants? Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> We're sorry, cursed. It's your, turn. <laughs> your turn. <laughs> so we use color in lots of different ways to visualize and study cells, especially with really complex things like the nervous system. There are historical processes like staining neurons with silver nitrate to make them easier to see in light mic- microscopy or more modern ones like injecting dye that selectively binds to certain parts of cells. And while these methods can be valuable, neurons are so dense and interconnected that scientists are always looking for other ways to try and untangle the mysteries of the nervous system by imaging them. And in 2007, two researchers named Joshua... Oh, I didn't... Josh and Jeff, (laughs) because I did not look up how to say their last names, uh, though other folks, I'm sure, contributed in their labs, uh, published a paper on a neuroimaging technique that they called Brainbow, uh, (laughs) which is very, very tongue-in-cheek, because Brainbow allows us to color neurons with anywhere from like 10 to 160 distinct colors, like a rainbow. And with this variety of colors, we can more easily watch individual cells and see how they grow and change and intertwine in a way that isn't possible with those simpler techniques. So Brainbow works because of similar color mixing principles as a digital screen. So pixel colors are generated by mixing together red, green, and blue lights of various strengths. And the neuron colors are generated by mixing together three to four different fluorescent proteins, which are activated when they're energized by UV light. So for example, uh, Brainbow 2.0 uses red, yellow, cyan, and green fluorescent proteins as its color palette. And Brainbow 3.0 uses coral M orange, which is orange, jellyfish EGFP, which is green, and sea anemone MK2, which is red. So more complicated names, but more stable proteins. And you have to breed transgenic animals for it to work, but the process of generating this like rainbow of colors from just a palette of three to four is very cool. You start out with a mouse with stem cells that have one full set of fluorescent protein genes each. They have they start out with this palette. And if you were to energize these cells and make them fluoresce, they'd all be the same color because they'd all be expressing the same palette of, of four colors. So what you want to do is jumble them all up so that you oh. get like a screen expressing different amounts of each color. And you jumble them up using a tool called uh, Cree-Lox recombination. And 
those are just two names of of different genetic markers. So LOX mm-hmm. sequences <clears throat> are kind of like a cut here symbol in DNA. And the LOX sequences tell Cree enzymes, which you can think of as like a craft kit, which pieces to cut out, swap, and stitch back together. So for example, if you have a red gene surrounded by two LOX sequences and a green gene surrounded by two LOX sequences in a cell, then dump, a, dump in a bunch of Cree enzymes, they are going to switch those two around. They're going to swap red and green. And if you have a bunch of genes marked for cutting and pasting, if you have a bunch of reds and yellows and cyan and green and dump in this enzyme, they're going to cut and paste all over the place. And with this recombination, you could end up with some neurons with like three greens, some with two greens and one red, some with two reds and one cyan. And that, like those pixels, creates this rainbow of color. And because genetic engineering is imprecise and weird, it's not only those combinations, but like sometimes you get extra colors thrown in there. Whoa. And that's what makes the brain bow. Um, and so of course there are drawbacks like like this, all this randomness in generating colors, meaning that you can tell neurons apart, but you can't label specific neurons with specific colors because you're you're relying on the system to just kind of like mm-hmm. jumble the fluorescence. But it has already led to some new understandings of things like retinal nerves and how certain neural pathways get reinforced or pruned down because we can really tell the difference between so many like tens or hundreds or thousands of neurons because they're all slightly different colors. Wow. And the images are really pretty. They're also very They look really pretty. cool. Can I have a brain bow with no negative repercussions? Well, you'd have to have a child with brain bow, I think. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't think we've ha- figured out how me. to do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's disappointing, um, but acceptable. I mean, they'd, you'd have to like cut open your brain in order to image it at some point. Like, you can't take this picture without like right. taking a slice of your brain. In my will, all right, you can cut my brain open and take a peek at it because it's going to look mm-hmm. cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm not like looking at like a, li- a live mouse brain right here. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Sam was ahead. Sam was ahead coming into this, but Sarah has pulled into the lead. Just understand. I loved that fact so much. And now it's time to ask the Science Couch, where we've got a question for our virtual couch of finely honed scientific minds. At Angel Pixie Dream asks, why do some colors make me happy while others make me sad? Mm. Can you talk about the correlation between color and emotional response? What I told Sari when she suggested this one was that it seems not real to me, but I'm probably wrong. No, it it seems like it's real. <laughs> uh, it might be cultural, um, but but it definitely like we've done. You know, you paint you paint a hospital, and people like feel different hmm. on the inside. I mean, yeah, I I mean, I think the reason why it feels fake is because there is a lot of pop psychology, and the way that a lot of these studies are conducted. So there's like two two pieces to this. In the way that color has two pieces, there's like color is a certain wavelength of light and it interacts with our bodies in measurable ways. Like we know that our cones and the photoreceptors inside them process light in certain ways. Um, In similar evolutionary biological ways, different colored light affects us differently. So a a good example of this is like blue light. Um, It messes with our circadian rhythms. There's a whole reason why uh, doctors, especially eye doctors, recommend like blue light blockers as you go towards bedtime because that blue light simulates daytime, messes with the circadian rhythms in your cells, and affects like your sleep wake gotcha. cycle and mm. how you're resting. And that's that's like the color blue. It may not look what, blue necessarily. Is looking at a blue wall the same as being exposed to blue light, or is it different? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's exactly the same. Yeah, I think okay. that it's a lot less, lot, many fewer photons. But if you shine enough light at a blue wall, especially then you got if it's a blue like light, blue light, baby. What's the difference? The, it would be the same as a blue light. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If I had to guess, and and like this is where, I guess like the other piece of it is like what like social cultural expectations do we mm-hmm. have based on a right. certain color? Hmm. That that's the way a lot of these studies are conducted, which is why. The research is so scattered because we don't go, okay, let's stick these humans in a dark room and then blast one wavelength of light at them at a time and see how they feel. It's more like we want to get a goal, like make Mm. hospital patients feel more relaxed or make incarcerated folks feel less aggressive Mm -hmm. or uh, do some. And so like, we're just going to 
paint a bunch of walls pink and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, or we're gonna like use different lighting and then ask people how they feel. So there's, there's not this like control with a lot of these color psychology Mm -hmm. studies that have like the same rigorous methods as, I don't know, like a, an experiment where you have a lot of compare and contrast, like the, the study with the different bowls and, and plate and foods where it's like, you have a red bowl or a blue bowl, but in this case, it's you're like choosing red and blue. You're not testing every bowl in every color of the rainbow and then asking people how their food tastes. Yeah. And it might just be things like if you have a hospital that's painted all beige and then you come through and you paint it and then you paint the doors different color, it's like a contrast. It might just like feel like someone cared more. Like there's all, there's all many confounding factors there. Right. It's just like, oh, it feels as if someone is treating this like a place where people are. This is a freshly rather than painted a place door. where we store human bodies. Right. A lot of people study the color red. Um, mm. Not entirely sure why, but maybe just because there's science already about it. And so people are like, oh, there's been some science about it. So I'm going to study the color red. And also because it's like the color of blood, the color of vascularized tissues. Yeah. Humans and there's turn also, red. Yeah. There's a lot of like red warning signals in nature. That is thought to be a combination of this biological Im- evolutionary impulse of like when people get aggressive or when people are physically exerting themselves, they mm-hmm. turn reddish. Um, and so there is this like physiological response associated with the color red that could also correlate with the color red being involved psychologically with things like health or Mm -hmm. Um, winning. So like, for example, there was a study on the 2004 Olympic games where contestants in four combat sports, boxing, taekwondo, Greco-Roman wrestling, and freestyle wrestling were randomly assigned red or blue outfits. Color had no effect on the outcome. They expected like 50, 50. These are top tier athletes. They should, Mm -hmm. they should like shake out evenly, but consistently across rounds in each competition, all the rounds had more red than blue winners. So the people who are wearing red outfits won their one-on-one combat sport matches more than people in blue outfits. Um, And this is repeated in like video game studies, other athletic studies. It was even in a small study about like placebo pills where the red placebo pill, as opposed to like green, blue, and yellow made people feel like slightly better. So there is something to do at least, or like there's a lot of literature specifically around the color red um, and like trying to understand in more nuanced ways than than just painting walls certain colors, why it feels to be like vitality and strength wow. for us. I can be an Olympian now. I just have to wear <laughs> some kind of red unitard and I'll, I'll destroy everybody. I'll I'm get just... out there on the wrestling ring. I'm not sure that's not what they call it. And then just absolutely get my knee bended backwards. <laughs> yeah. Very strong. The shortest knee. and most embarrassing career in Olympic history. <laughs> <laughs> but we got to let him do it. He's Hank Green, for God's sake. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. I'm just thinking about how I wear a lot of blue and my wife wears a lot of red. And she kicks my ass up and down the street every day. So <laughs> I got I to change some things. Uh-huh. If you want to ask the Science Couch your question, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShow Tangents, where we'll tweet out <sighs> topics for upcoming episodes every week. Or you can join the SciShow Tangents Patreon and ask us on our Discord. Thank you to at Unjust Enrichment on Twitter, Jan Rett Sammies on Discord, and everybody else who asked us your questions for this episode. If you like this show and you want to help us out, it's real easy to do that. First, you can go to patreon.com slash SciShow Tangents, become a patron, get access to all of our amazing stuff. We've got newsletter, bonus episodes. Got a special thanks also shouting out John Pollock and Les Aker. Thank you to you both. We've also got a new Patreon goal. We hit our last goal. We did a movie commentary of Cars 2, which we in which we tried to figure out a bunch of different scientific mysteries of the Cars universe yeah. for our new goal. Once we hit 700 patrons, we're going to be watching the movie Minions to see if we can determine just how much those little guys are pissing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm finding about this right now. <laughs> so if you haven't already, become a patron at patreon.com slash scishowtangents. Get us in that Minion booth. And if you're already a patron, please spread the word. Ah, uh, we have to see that piss, is what my <laughs> show note says. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Second, 
That was just the first thing. Second, you could leave us a review wherever you listen. That helps us know what you like about the show and other people get to find out about us too. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, just tell tell people people about about us. us. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz. Our associate producer is Faith Schmidt. Our editor is Seth Glicksman. Thank you, Seth. Our story editor is Alex Billo. Our social media organizer is Julia buzz Our editorial assistant is Deboki Trakravarti. Our sound design is by Joseph Tunamedish. Our executive producers are Caitlin Hoffmeister and me, Hank Green. And of course, we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing. When Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI had their first son, he became the Dauphin of France, which is a title that meant he was the heir to the throne, even though it sounds kind of silly and like dolphin. (laughs) And even in the 1700s, people were curious about any shred of news about the royal family. So when baby Louis Joseph was born in 1781, he became famous thanks to the royal family's trendiness. The color, Coca Dauphin, grayish greenish brown that was the same hue as his soiled diapers became all the rage with french aristocrats (laughs) and even though this kid died at the age of 77 years old because of surprise surprise tuberculosis his poop lives on thanks to uh, fad colors and also the french chemists who made it possible caca dauphin the fashionable baby poop color do we know what color it was still I mean, you've seen baby poop, right? I'm looking at it right now. Not baby poop, just a swatch. (laughs) Just a swatch. It's a nice color. I've got a baby poop folder.